earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten those who seek God shall never go on nothing can trouble nothing can frighten God alone One of the pastors that I most admire and love is Leonard Ravenhill, who was a British-American preacher. And he was often fond of saying and became associated with this particular quote, no man is greater than his prayer life. And you could say, of course, no man or woman is greater than their prayer life. This emphasizes the deep power that we realize in prayer, the blessings we get in prayer. And it's a challenge to me to think I am no greater than my prayer life. This is a truth I'm continuing to appreciate and grow into. And as Philip Yancey says in his book about prayer, I agree in saying that I speak about prayer as a pilgrim, not as an expert. In fact, my main qualification for speaking about prayer is that I feel so unqualified and genuinely want to learn. And so we could talk about all of the many reasons why we should pray, and we could spend weeks and weeks exhausting all of the benefits that we get from prayer, and many of us have heard of these and realized these, but at the very beginning of it, I think as followers of Jesus Christ, the simple answer to why do we pray is first and foremost, we pray because our Lord and Savior Jesus prayed. Think about it. Jesus, who was the Son of God, took time in his ministry to pray, to commune with God, to rely on the Father's power to be able to do his ministry. Jesus, who knew that his ministry on earth would be very brief, there would always be people, more people to share the good news with, more people to heal, more people to pray with, more people to touch with the power of God. And yet Jesus, again and again, we see in the Gospels, taking time away from the people to connect with the Father in prayer. Jesus the way he prayed must have been very powerful. The disciples, it's recorded, they never, they, they never asked Jesus to teach them how to do miracles. It's never recorded of the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to preach. But the Gospels make very clear that the disciples asked Jesus to teach us to pray. And as Jewish believers, the 12 disciples certainly had prayer as part of their lives. That was part of Jewish spirituality to be rooted in prayer. But there must have been something so powerful about the way Jesus prayed and the way the disciples observed Jesus emerging from his time of prayer that they begged him, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like you pray, Jesus. Now, we do pray because Jesus prayed, and we know the blessings of prayer, and we 
are striving to live into this relationship with a living Lord and the the way that God has given us this gift of communicating with him is through prayer. So we know how important it is, but the reality is so many of us in the church still think of prayer as a huge mystery. We come to church and we let the people up front pray. Or we read the words that are printed in the bulletin and we pray. Or we, we pray at grace before meals. And that's all wonderful. But when it comes to how do we develop this relationship ourselves with God in prayer, I would guess that many of us feel like I said at the beginning, we're unqualified, but yet we're eager to learn. And so this morning as we begin this series of messages about prayer, we want to first begin by addressing just some of the fundamental things to remember as we live this life of prayer, perhaps for some of you entering into this life of prayer in a new way. We're calling this basic training. And I really wanted in this message this morning to give some, some succinct principles for us to take hold of, whether we're beginning in this whole adventure of prayer or whether we have been praying and growing in our relationship with Jesus for years, what are some things we might be able to take away, some specific nuggets we could take away to practice in our life of prayer and our life of faith, and, and how, how could we remember these points? Because I certainly recognize that on any given Sunday, 15 minutes out of, after you walk out of here, you probably have forgotten most of what I've said. And then I remembered Dr. Memory. And if you were with us about a month ago, you remember Jerry Lucas and his very unique way of convincing us that we have more ability to remember than we give ourselves credit to. And so I'm going to take a page from Jerry Lucas this morning. And hopefully you'll remember at least something of these basic principles of prayer. And so I'm calling these the ABCs of prayer. And so first of all, I'd like you to think of the letter A and think of an apple. Think of the letter B, a book. C, a chair. D, a door. E, an ear. F, Think of fire. And G, I invite you to think of God. And of course, God is a more abstract thing for us to picture because we don't see God. But what I'm specifically inviting us to think about when we think about God in this context is the way we as Christians understand the very being of God, which is the Trinity, the triune God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Because I believe it's it's rich for us when we enter into this life of prayer to recognize how all three persons of the Trinity are, are integrally involved with us as we pray. So, let me try this out. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, we're off to a good start. <laughs> well, let's talk about each of these, flesh them out a little bit. I asked you to think of apple for A. We all remember the phrase probably we were taught as kids, an apple a day keeps... Of course, the, 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 the teaching being that when we have an apple every day, it's supposed to keep us in really good health. And the same principle applies to prayer. If we take a time, a dedicated time for prayer each and every day, it benefits our entire well-being, our spiritual health, to be able to do this every single day, and not just hit or miss when we feel like it, but just to set aside that special time, each 24-hour period, for us to really enjoy being with God. You know, as, as, as people, we wouldn't think of going a day without eating, or without taking a shower, or brushing our teeth, or checking your email, or walking your dog. 
So why should it be as Christians that we would ever think we go a day without spending time with God in prayer? That is part of how God created us to be here on earth, is to share this communion with him. And so this is just as vital as all those other things we make time to do each and every day. Prayer every day is vital. And just as we learned an apple a day can keep the doctor away, we could also say a time of prayer a day keeps the devil away. And I say this recognizing that the modern world has tended to dismiss this concept that there's any kind of spiritual forces out there contrary to the, the goodness of God. Pope Francis recently said, the devil's greatest achievement in today's world is convincing people he does not exist. The devil is just fine with you thinking he doesn't exist because that way he can just be even more cunning and getting to us. Now, we don't need to be afraid of the devil because Jesus Christ is so much more powerful than he is, but we need to be aware. First Peter says that the devil, our enemy, is like a prowling lion seeking to devour us. And the chief goal of the devil is not, as we might think, to make us do things that are bad. The chief goal of the devil is to disrupt our connection with God. To disrupt our connection with God. Because it's that connection with God that we experience most of all through prayer that reminds us of who we truly are. And we are God's beloved. The Hebrew word translated as Satan means accuser. And one of the things that our spiritual enemy wants to do most of all is accuse us and remind us that we are not, or try to convince us that we're not worthy, that we're not lovable, that we are not forgiven. And so we often live with this guilt and this low self-esteem and this, and this feeling of failure in our lives where our connection with the living God constantly reminds us who we are and we are beautiful in God's sight. We are forgiven. We are set free from all that would seek to weigh us down. You know, in the very same teaching where the apostles ask Jesus, teach us to pray, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prays in that prayer, lead us not into temptation. And the actual wording in the Greek is, deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus in John 8 said that he is the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. And in that same passage, Jesus also says, yes, he's the father of lies, but you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so having this prayer time every day is the greatest way to recalibrate ourselves spiritually, rooting ourselves in our ultimate identity, which is God's beloved. So, what a gift it is to be able to carve out that time each and every day to re-nourish ourselves, our spiritual health and well-being. Now, I also invite you to remember B, a book. Because often when we, we venture out into this life of prayer, it can be very intimidating trying to figure out what do you say. Okay, you're sitting there. You're making time to pray. How do you find the words? And so I encourage all of us to walk into that exercise of prayer accompanied by a book. A book to help guide us and center us. It can be the Bible, using the Psalms, which of course were originally composed as prayers. Or any part of the scriptures really can prompt us to pray as we read the words of God, to be able to think about our own relationship with God. But in addition to the Bible, you can use a hymn book. A hymn book. The hymns are all, in many ways, forms of prayers. And you can offer those, even if you don't want to sing them, you can say those words. And they're wonderful words of prayer. And in addition to that, there are so many wonderful books that have helped people, including myself, and still helps me, as I go into prayer, that are prayers composed by others, that help enrich our own prayer language. And so even if you're a seasoned prayer warrior, it's so wonderful sometimes to be able to enrich our own prayer vocabulary with the words of the saints who have also enjoyed a rich relationship with God. One of those books that we have in our church library is the book Jesus Calling, 
which is written from the perspective of Jesus inviting us into a deeper relationship with him. So as we read Jesus' words, we respond in, in, in ways based on Jesus' promptings. Our, our church library has other resources too. Check them out, resources to buy, resources to, to, to check out on loan that can help you in your, in your prayer life. Any of you can do that. You don't need to be a member of the church. Just check out our church library or go to a bookstore somewhere because living this life of prayer can be so greatly helped when we have a book to guide us and enrich our prayer life. For many people, this book is a journal. If you like to write, a journal can be wonderful to write down your prayers, your thoughts, to write down those things you want to talk to God about. And when you see the answers to prayers, to write those down as well. Recognize it is okay to, to use a book. Now, we don't want to just read those prayers in a rote way because then those are just vain repetitions. But use those words of others to prompt your own ability to speak with God. And it will deepen your prayer life. See, I invite you to think of a chair. And picture a chair. Maybe picture a chair somewhere in your house, your lanai, uh, a bench in a park that you love to go to. But each of us needs to find a certain place in our lives, I believe, where that's our regular place to meet with God. Bill Hybels, in his book, Too Busy Not to Pray, says, if you want to learn to pray, find yourself in a quiet place free of distraction. That's key, free of distraction. It doesn't have to be a chapel. It can be the kitchen pantry, your office, or the front seat of your pickup truck. As long as the surroundings are familiar and quiet. Go there, he says, during the best part of your day. In the morning if you're a lark, at night if you're an owl, or whatever time you feel most alert. Meet with the Lord there regularly, every day. And I'd like to emphasize the point he made there about a place that's free of distraction. Let this be a place that is a sanctuary in your home or in your, in your community where you go to meet with God. And I know in this age where we have so many wonderful apps on our smartphones that can help us in prayer, even the Bible on our cell phone, my encouragement is don't use that for your time alone with God because that same cell phone that gives you the apps that lead you into presence of God also will give you text messages and emails and phone calls that will distract you. So use those apps wonderfully to deepen your relationship with God. But for this time of your day, put the phone in a drawer so there is not that distraction. And I speak from experience here. That's why I say this. Now, of course, sitting in a chair for some of you may seem like torture because you like to move. You like, you need the physical activity. And if that's the case, that's fine. Find a place where you can move. Maybe it's the same stretch of beach every day, or maybe it's a park where you can walk around. Come to our memorial garden and just walk around there. Whatever it is, find a place, find a special place for you to meet with God. And maybe thinking about a chair will help you prioritize that in your life. Now, it's very important, I believe, to find that time each and every day for us to be with God. I often hear people saying, well, I talk to God throughout the day. And that's, that's wonderful. We should talk to God throughout the day. But don't use that as an excuse why we shouldn't spend that dedicated time with God. Because it's when we spend that dedicated time with God that our relationship deepens in a way that just talking to God throughout the day cannot possibly shape us. At the same time... We should be careful not to just compartmentalize our lives and say, well, I'm going to take this 30 minutes a day to sit and pray, and then you forget about God the whole rest of the day. And again, I speak from experience, having been very good about setting aside my devotional time, and, and then I have my time of prayer every day, and then the rest of the day I have to confess, how often am I really thinking about God? And so to balance out this idea of your dedicated time, symbolized by the chair, I invite you to think of a door. Because my invitation to you, to all of us, as a way of thinking about prayer in a deeper way, is to think of the very habitual act of entering a door. And the invitation is to pray every time 
you open a door. Now that could be a lot of times during our day, of course, but even if you or I remember that just a few times each day, think how transformative that can be. You're walking into a doctor's office, not sure about what diagnosis you're going to get. You walk in that door. May that be a threshold of prayer. You're going to your school classroom. Pray for your teacher and, of course, pray for yourself that you learn the material and you do well on the test. You walk into uh, your home after you've been out or you're walking out of your home to go and have fun during the day. Offer that prayer to God to bless you and to bless those who are with you. If you go into a restaurant, you walk in that door, you pray God's blessing upon those who will serve you, that God will shine his light through you to all those people who are in the restaurant with you, that you would be a blessing. You pray as you get into your car door. Goodness knows, we ask God to help us as we get behind the wheel of the car. Think about that. And also, if this becomes a habit then you're also thinking about prayer when you're about ready to go into the door of that place where God would not want you to go. And just imagine the power if each one of us, as we walked in the doors of this church every Lord's Day, we walk in that door and we say a prayer just quietly to ourselves at that point, asking God to anoint this sanctuary with his mighty power each and every time we gather. Can you imagine the power that could happen with all the hundreds of us offering that prayer when we walk in the doors? Remember the gift of praying. And maybe when you turn that door handle, you'll think about Every place is an opportunity where you can invite God to go with you. E. It's important for us to think about our ears. To remember that prayer is not just about us talking to God. Sometimes we're taught that in the church, that prayer is just us offering our words. But, but prayer is a dialogue. It's us offering our words, but it's also listening for God. And whether it's the audible voice of God we hear or the impressions of God that come to us as we sit in silence before God, God does lead us and speak to us when we have those focused times of prayer with him. I've shared with you before that one of the most transformative experiences of my life was when I saw a spiritual director and he said, Chris, before I give you any other work to do to try to grow in your relationship with God, I want you to take 20 minutes every day and just sit in silence before God. Just say the name of Jesus Christ and say, here I am, Lord, and then sit there for 20 minutes without saying a word. And it was hard. It was really hard because we don't do that much in life, sitting for that extended period of time in silence. But it is transformative because sitting in that silence, and don't worry if your mind begins to wander, because sometimes God takes our minds where he wants our minds to go. And if you can sense in your wandering mind that you're going to that place about your grocery list or what you have to do at work or whatever, and, and it's, it's leading you away from thinking about God and, and God's plans for your life, then, then you can always just say the name of Jesus and bring yourself back. But don't, don't worry about that. Don't make that be a barrier to spending this time in silence, because there's richness in that silence. Mother Teresa has said the beginning of prayer is silence. God is speaking in the silence of the heart. And then she said, we start talking to God from the fullness of the heart. And there are times that we just can't find the words to pray. But in those silent, wordless times, Romans 8 tells us the Spirit of God is praying for us with groans too deep for words. Isn't that a comforting thought? F. I invite you to think of fire. Fire in the sense of the fire that is our desire our passion for being with God. Because for so many, prayer is more of a duty than a delight. 
And God invites us to this incredible adventure of knowing him in prayer. And one thing I need to pray for and I encourage you to pray for is for desire. Pray for that desire to be with God. Pray for God to kindle that desire in your heart and see what happens. If you say, well, I, I just, I, I don't know, I just kind of forget to pray or I don't feel like praying, pray for desire. Pray for that fire in your heart and see what happens. Like the old hymn says, teach me to love thee as thine angels love. One holy passion filling all my frame. As James Howell says in his book, The Beautiful Work of Learning to Pray, prayer cannot begin until you've decided that in your deepest self you want a different life, a richer life. You refuse to go on as is. You want the tenderness of God's grace to be as fresh as the air you breathe. And too many of us just are content to live as is when there is so much more that is offered us through a life of prayer. And so pray for that fire to be kindled in your heart. And then think of God. Of course, think of God every time you pray. But I invite you specifically to think about the three persons of the Godhead. Because each one is so, so beautifully involved in our, in our life of prayer. First of all, you think of the, the Father. God the Father. And Jesus addressed him in his prayer life as as Abba, which was a tender term in Aramaic that mean daddy, a revolutionary way of referring to, to God the Father by calling him with this tender, loving term of Abba. And I know in this world, sometimes it's difficult for us to think about God as Father because maybe your relationship with your dad was not what it should have been. But Jesus reminds us that we have a heavenly Father who is so much different than any earthly father could ever be, even better than the best earthly father could ever be. Jesus said in the same teaching, where he gave the Lord's Prayer, he, he said, talked about God as Father, and he said, who of you, if your child asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? Or who of you, if your child asked for a fish, would give them a snake? And Jesus said, if, if we who are so imperfect, would always want to give the very best to our own children. Think about God who is holy and perfect, how much more he would want to give to you in prayer. Think of the Son, Jesus, thanking him for the cross, for the resurrection, remembering, as, as Kate reminded us, what Jesus said in John 15, abide in me, for apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus wants us to abide in him. He is a living Lord, as we sang earlier today. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name when we pray. It's not a magic formula we affix to the end of our prayers. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are reminding ourselves that we are praying in the authority of Jesus, whom the Bible says is actually delivering our prayers to the throne of God in heaven. And do think of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is within you who is praying for you even as Jesus is praying for us. The Spirit prays for us. And pray for the Spirit to activate His fruit in our life. That wonderful fruit of the Holy Spirit, the way we live, that's the Holy Spirit that enables that. And one of the prayers I like to make every day is, Dear Lord, help me to show your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your generosity, your faithfulness, your gentleness, and your self-control for the display of your splendor today. That's acknowledging the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. And so to review, I don't expect you to remember all seven of these points, but if one of these points strikes a chord in your heart, follow God's leading. Whether it's the apple reminding us that it's a daily habit of prayer that changes our life, or B, finding a book to accompany you, or C, finding that chair, that place where you can meet with God that's your sacred space in your life, or D, thinking about this practice of, of praying every time you enter a door, or, or E, thinking about your ear and, and maybe spending more time listening to God in your life, or F, the fire, praying for more of that desire for God. 
and maybe deepening your prayer life by partnering with all three members of the Trinity, acknowledging the fullness of God. The great preacher A.W. Tozer, who was one of the greatest prayers, I think, of all time. He was often asked about prayer. He taught on prayer. And someone once asked A.W. Tozer, what is the secret to really having a life of prayer? And Tozer said, the key to prayer is simply praying. So let's do it for God's glory. Amen. Please stand.